Welcome everybody. It's Lisa Salberg with the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association here with Dr. Kia Afshar from Intramountain Medical in Utah. And we're going to have a discussion today about the program at Intramountain, their center of excellence, and a little bit about the program and the positions behind the program. So welcome Dr. Afshar to our program. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Absolutely. Can't wait to see the questions as they come in as our viewers start to join us. And we are, I'm going to kind of pause here for a second, even though when this goes live later, everybody's going to be able to watch it at their own time, but we're going to populate this a little bit and wait for people to show up. So three, two, one, we should start seeing that. Oh, here we go. So we now have people joining us and now it's fun to start this. So this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're watching us from, uh, I'm here in New Jersey and Dr. Asher is out in Utah, which is a great way to communicate rather than having to drive across country. And I've asked him to join us today to tell us a little bit about the Intermountain Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center of Excellence and the program there. So why don't you tell us how this all got started and how you guys got interested in HCM? So the way it got started is I joined uh, Intermountain Medical Center here in 2014 and I did my training at Cleveland Clinic, which is a large very large uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy center of excellence with very high volumes of patients. And these are patients that I saw often as a trainee. And I kind of got used to the way the Cleveland Clinic did it, which was one of the best ways to do it. They took care of phenomenal care of the patients when it came to uh, imaging, as well as uh, intervention, as well as medications and genetic screening and genetic testing and family screening. And when I got here, I noticed that there were a few patients with HCM that I would come through my clinic that kind of had a little bit more, I guess, less organized care than I would expect. Um, you know, they, the EP docs were great at dealing with their electrophysiology issues, but they weren't great at the family screening. Or the interventionalist was great at doing an alcohol subtilation, but would forget to uh, screen for sudden cardiac death. So the idea was let's create. Uh, let's filter patients through two or three HCM clinical experts, make, use you know who are experts in imaging as well, and then make sure that patients get a hold of the care, you know sudden cardiac death screening, genetic testing, family screening, appropriate echoes, uh, MRI when indicated, and also the appropriate intervention uh, per the patient's needs. I mean different patients need different types of interventions, so. The idea was to have the patients, instead of 150 patients seeing 30 different cardiologists, have the 150 patients see three different cardiologists and only see one electrophysiologist, one interventionalist, one surgeon. Um, so then that's how it kind of started. And we just basically didn't try to reinvent the wheel. We just used Cleveland Clinic's model here. I mean, and we had people who trained at Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic to be here to take care of these patients. So it worked out well. So how did you even become interested in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy back at Cleveland Clinic to bring it to Utah? So I think the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, since Cleveland Clinic was such a high volume, even in the four years there as a trainee, I saw so many patients with it. And I realized that they all have, they're, every patient's, I wouldn't say every patient's different, but they're very, very different. They have different physiology. They have different uh, genetics, of course. They have different not every alcohol subtilation is the same. Not every myectomy is the same. Not every um, medication works the same in each patient. Um, so the physiology of the disease is very fascinating, as well as the fact that every patient is different. So it keeps you on your toes. You really, really have to be an expert in it to uh, take care of these patients. I mean, there's no one size fits all. The other, the other aspect of it was you could really make a huge impact with in these patients with very I won't say minimal stuff, but making sure they're not on the wrong meds, making sure they're on the right medications. You know, you can prevent sudden death if you screen people appropriately and get them a prophylactic ICD. A myectomy can make someone go from very dysfunctional uh, exercise tolerance to almost a normal life. And then it's night and day difference. So seeing that was awesome. And then finally, the family aspect is pretty awesome. I mean, you could potentially take care of patients you will never see by you know, you would never normally see unless you do appropriate family screening or genetic testing. And that, that, that aspect of it was awesome too. So it has the physiology, it has the ability to make a significant difference. It has the effect of, it affects families. And um, it's also 
kind of spans all aspects of cardiology. So kind of, you know, and also not every patient's the same, which makes you, keeps you reading a lot and talking to experts and on your toes. So we, we've gotten some comments from some of your fan club out there in Utah. Some names I'm thinking you're going to recognize. Debbie and Jake have popped in and said hello. And uh, Jake says you're the coolest. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the practice in terms of your role in it. Or, you know, Who do you see? How do you see them? And where do you take the patient to before you hand them off to somebody else in the team? Yeah, so what we do is we have um, three non-proceduralists and the idea is that definitely have a non-proceduralist be um the kind of the first person um that takes care of the whole patient and the reason why is a lot of times the patients refer to a proceduralist they may get that procedure done which may not be in the patient's best interest so the idea is to have a non-vested interest in the in the procedure that needs to be done so there are three of us me um dr hebel who trained at mayo clinic and was in their hcm clinic there and Dr. Dave Min, who was uh, at Cleveland Clinic with me and was in an HCM clinic there as his clinic. So the three of us uh, take care of the patients in a holistic manner. And then we collaborate on any patients that have no kind of, or have need multidisciplinary discussions about if they need a procedure, for example, an ICD, a myectomy, or an alcohol septal ablation. If it's not a clear cut, slam dunk case, the three of us get together to discuss the case to make sure that we use the multimodality imaging, you know, exercise echo, the echo, the MRI, to make sure we're doing the right thing for this patient. In that case, they're kind of in the HCM clinic and they will usually see the same provider every time, but sometimes they'll see, uh, if they may see me the first time and Dr. Min the second time or me the first time and Dr. Hebel the second time, but they will stay amongst the three of us, their, their entire care to manage their holistic HCM care. And then we refer them to our EP doc, our interventionist, or our surgeon, uh, depending if they need those procedures or not. You also work with heart transplant patients, correct? Absolutely. So Dr. Hebel and I both happen to also be trained in heart failure and transplantation. And so we um, will take care of the patients beforehand and also after they get their transplant with two other of our colleagues. Okay. And in electrophysiology, who's the team there now? It's Jared Bunch, who um, is fantastic. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. He also did all his training at Mayo Clinic and uh, was involved in their HCM center when he was there. Um, so he's our go-to electrophysiologist for, honestly, what any case we have, we'll get a phenomenal answer from him and a very thoughtful and well-versed in the literature. So that's Jared Bunch. I actually met Jared a long time before I met you and was always impressed with his knowledge, specifically in the area of atrial fibrillation. He really is a thought leader in the field, so we're lucky to have him on our team. We're happy about that. So tell us a little bit about the Intermount and the hospital system and what it would be like if somebody wanted to travel to you to see you as a physician. Yeah, so Intermount is a nonprofit. Uh, we have 22 hospitals throughout Utah and Idaho. Um, in 130 clinics, and um, and the main hospital is in Salt Lake City, a little bit south of Salt Lake City. Technically, it's in Murray, but it's about six miles south of downtown, and that's the, the hospital that does transplants, does heart pumps, takes care of the HCM patients, the myectomies, and things like that. So it's the main, the main hub hospital. Um, it is a, it's kind of like on the um, spectrum of Kaiser. It's a nonprofit, takes care of patients in a hub and spoke model, has its own insurance company. Um, and in the, the, the motto is having patients live the healthiest lives possible. And they really do do a, a phenomenal job of making sure that it's, it's way beyond just one patient, one physician, but more patient, their families, and the whole aspect of their care. If you were to come to Salt Lake City to see us, you would you know, depending on where you're traveling from, we do have ways to accommodate out-of-town visitors with local accommodations at uh, discounted prices, as well as we have the ability to um, do all the testing in one or two days so that patients are not coming, getting one test, and then going back 300 miles and then kind of come back for other. So once we know you're coming from afar, you can get almost everything you need to get done in one or two days. And um, 
we rarely ever set people up for procedures. Just we feel like it's it's hard to set, set someone up for a procedure when you haven't met them, talked to them, and actually looked at the primary data with their own eyes. So sometimes you have to come back if you're going to get a procedure. For example, a myectomy, alcohol self-deblation, or ICD. But otherwise, we can pretty much get everything done in one or two days um, and accommodate people traveling. So you've been a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy association recognized center of excellence for about a year and a half now, I would guess. Yep. And yeah. have, have you seen a change in the practice since you become associated with our organization? Yeah, so for the answer is definitely. Our, our volumes have gone up uh, in many different ways. One is that Intermountain now filters all those patients through to us. So we just now, instead of, like I said, 150 patients or 250 patients seeing 20 different cardiologists, now they're seeing three. In addition, we're getting referrals from the HCMA website as well as from uh, patients just using the internet to find a uh, center of excellence once they have their diagnosis. In addition, our myectomy volumes have gone up and our myectomy outcomes are much, much better. Our, it used to be kind of pre-HCM center of excellence. Our, we wouldn't necessarily have complete obliteration of gradients and we would still have residual gradients and some lot of times residual symptoms. <laughs> Now, uh, Dr. Reed, our surgeon, went to Cleveland Clinic and worked with Dr. Smadira to learn the new contemporary extended myectomy, and the outcomes are fantastic. If I had to take the last 20 versus 20 before that, I can tell you that I won't say night and day difference, but significantly better. Um, in addition, patients are just getting more kind of comprehensive care. They're getting genetic testing. Our, we hired a second genetic cardiac genetic counselor specifically because of HCM volume our mri volume has gone up tremendously and our exercise echo uh protocols have been refined so it's definitely changed a lot and it keeps us on our toes and we recruited dr hebel here from um ohsu because of our hcm volume she's both heart failure transplant but like i mentioned she does hypertrophy so she was one of the reasons we recruited specifically her was her experience at mayo clinic and hypertrophy so things have changed a lot in 18 months i told you we'd be job security and keep you busy Never go no. with us. So I'm going to ask you some tricky questions today. And they don't have right or wrong answers. I'm just curious as to your uh, input here. What do you think are the biggest challenges in treating and managing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients individually and, whole, and, and as a group? Huh. So I, I mentioned earlier that not every patient's the same. I mean, if you look, went to med school, you'd assume that you have patients with hypertrophy, you do X, Y, and Z, and everything's perfect. Um, and that's not the case. Also, even their myectomies, you get you get surprised in the OR that someone's anatomy is a little bit different and was not what you're expecting. Not not a complete surprise, but just it's one of those things where they're all a little bit different. And that 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 is that is probably one of the challenges. The other one is is the huge one is education of family. Like a lot of patients and their families, especially their families, once they have a family member with this, they they a lot of times don't want to get screened or don't want to get tested. And that, that is a, that's a big one. And that, that's one that scares me. It's the one that keeps me up at night is the um, fact that someone out there could have this and, you know, you can prophylax against sudden death or prophylax against a stroke. If you knew, if you diagnose them in the asymptomatic phase, but the fact that certain people are wary about life insurance or disability insurance or getting fired from their company and that prevents them from being, seen at a hypertrophic center, center of excellence, that, that that concerns me a lot. That's one of the challenges. Um, and then misdiagnosis. I mean, patients, you see them come in with asthma or double pneumonia or or anxiety and stuff like that. And they and those are the ones that I get concerned about that, you know, a benign flow murmur. And those are the, the, that's one of the challenges to educate the physicians out there that, you know, you need to do more dynamic physical exams, or you need to get echoes with lower thresholds in certain populations. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think. So I just came back from a support group meeting in Orlando, Florida last night, which explains why Lisa's a little tired today. Um, but I, what you just said is quite interesting. We talked about what were the challenges in that particular group, and somebody was talking about not their family members not wanting to get screened and how, what do we recommend people do to get their family screened? And it is a big challenging question. I mean, I've been doing this for 22 years and I don't have the right answer. I even have family members who 
opt not to get screened or go for their evaluations as frequently as we might want. What do you think we might be able to do to ease the burden to the families of understanding a diagnosis of HCM does not mean your life is stopped. It might mean there's a couple of different things you have to think about and do, but just as a, a conversation and a thought, are there anything we can do to help facilitate that or is there a practice that you've tried that works better than others? Yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what really works. I'll tell you what I, I usually say. I say, listen, this is a disease where most of the stuff you read is online or on the news is a select few, the one, the exceptional cases usually. Most people can, can, I always use the word can, live a normal longevity of life and pretty normal quality of life if they're treated appropriately and they're diagnosed. In order to be treated appropriately, you need to be diagnosed with it. So it's not one of those things where I want people to be 100% scared that they have this and they're going to end up on TV for having sudden death, but more that if you can prevent a stroke or you know ventricular arrhythmia or just progressive heart failure symptoms by getting diagnosed earlier, that can help. I also tell them that you know you know disability and life insurance things are are important, but they're not important more important than preventing a stroke, and they're not more important than preventing sudden death. So I just say, listen, there's, you know, there, life insurance is, in, is important and disability insurance is important, but I think these other things are more important. So you got it. You know, the reality is that you have a 50% chance of having this or, um, as, and you, we need to know whether you have it or not. It's hard. Uh, it's it hard. Is a hard question. It, it, it's, I don't think there's a great answer to it yet. We do have our dear family letter that, you know, we're willing to send out to anybody who needs it. I'm sure your genetic counselors have a similar letter. Uh, we've discussed that. But uh, for anybody who's viewing who has a family member who's on the fence, you might want to send them this link as to why we think it's important that they get screened. And we we offer some you know documentation to explain to them. It's not just their annoying family member telling them to have a pr procedure done or a testing done. It's all about making sure that they're well for the long term. And uh, whatever treatment modality they might need, we want to make sure that they get to the right, right treatment. So those are the challenges. Um, where do you see the future of HCM going? Do you see any changes coming down the path in terms of management, diagnosis, or innovative therapies? Yeah, I think the, the challenges and the future, I think, are what to do with the patients who have a family member with HCM and then they have an echo that's not 100% normal and then they get a cardiac alarm that's not 100% normal but doesn't meet clear-cut definitions of HCM. So, um, you know, now that we have better technologies to diagnose abnormalities in the heart, specifically cardiac MRI and genetic testing, we may be picking up people way earlier than we used to or um, because of aggressive family screening and aggressive genetic testing, which is appropriate, but what to do with them? Are they do they have the same sudden cardiac death risk as the classic HCM risk factors? Um, that's that's the that's I think one of the ones we, we need to figure out too. And then second thing I think one of the future and um, challenges is exercise. I mean, you have one element where it's deemed a you 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 know class one A sports only where you can go bowling and curling and darts and you know a few other things. Uh, walking, of course, but the, the question is, what long-term outcomes do that have on patients who end up obese and depressed and not able to do the things they love and higher risk of diabetes, coronary disease, and now you've traded maybe a low, um, a slightly lower risk of ventricular arrhythmias for a whole whole host of other diseases or ailments. And so that, I think the, the, the exercise recommendations are one of those the trickiest things that I think the future is going to have to figure out what's what's the right sweet spot. I think the pendulum has swung, you know, one way a little bit too much, and I think we have to find where the appropriate place is in the middle. I don't, I don't think patient, patients should be in triathlons, but at the same time, I think sitting on your couch and playing darts is not the solution either. Um, Which new I novel medications. A second there, and take this opportunity to pitch the Live HCM study which we are still recruiting for. We're coming into the home stretch. 
We need about 2,200 patients. There you go. Hold that brochure up. Um, this is Live HCM. If you are between the ages of 8 and 60 with a diagnosis of HCM or a genetic mutation for HCM, you can participate in research. You get a Fitbit. We're going to monitor your activity. Whatever activity level you're at, if you're playing darts and sitting on the couch, we need to know that. And if you are running 5 or 10 Ks, we need to know that. And then we need to see over time which patient population does the best, what exercise is too much, what's too little. We need to find that sweet spot because I know I'm asked almost every single day, where's the line? How much is too much? What's too little? And the answer is we don't have a lot of good data on that right now, and we're trying to collect it. And in this NIH-sponsored study, which the HCMA is one of the co-PIs on it, we want all of you who are watching to participate. It doesn't take much. You're, it's a self-referral. You call the number. You can get the information directly from the HCMA website or go to livehcm.org, and you can call one of the coordinators. They'll walk you through the whole process. It's really easy. So you gave me the platform. I took it. Now back to you. <laughs> what else do you see in the future for HCM? Uh, not novel medications. I mean, this is... You know, we've been using a medic, you know, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers for, you know, 40, 50 years that are non-specific for this disease. You know, they just, they affect the physiology um, to hopefully help um, arrhythmias and the gradients. But, you know, either orphan medications or novel medications specifically for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, that's, that's going to be potentially part of the future. And, you know, we need patients to be willing to participate in those studies and uh, but we also need you know companies to uh, be willing to invest in making drugs that are specific to this disease we, we got close with one drug and that was through Gilead and unfortunately the drug was abandoned we have a new opportunity with the myocardia drug um, it's only, you know, it's still in trial and uh, it's really early days to determine where that's going to be. But it is exciting to see, you know, entire business models made up on how to uh, attract, you know, a, a, a drug therapy to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy specifically. Um, I do think that there is a big opportunity for other drug companies to come into the space and look at it from their own points of view. The concept of using sodium channel blockers is really interesting. The one preparation didn't quite work well enough because of what happened in the non-HCM arm of the study, but I still think there's an opportunity there, not only for you know pathways that we may already understand well enough, you know maybe tweaking a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker or a sodium blocker, but maybe there's other ways of doing this, like myocardia is looking at targeting the sarcomere, are there other things that we can do to attenuate cardioenergetics in a new way? I think we're on the cusp of a few things, but we'll see. I, I will ask you, being that you are a heart failure and transplant specialist as well, in the last number of years, we've gotten really good at managing HCM. So good, in fact, that those patients who've survived are now going into the next stage, stage of disease, like me and other people who will then go to transplant. Do you see the uptick in transplantation evaluation in HCM becoming something that is gonna take more attention or what do you see happening there? So I actually am lucky that I can wear two different hats and see it from the HCM side as well as from the transplant side. And um, the reality is this, and I, I gotta say this in a nice way. Um, the fact that HCM patients don't have, usually don't have LVADs as a, an option, and a lot of times inotropes like dobutamine or milrinone are not great options. Sometimes they work, but the risk of arrhythmias is higher with them. It gives them a disadvantage on the transplant list um, because they need, and yeah, it gives them a disadvantage on the transplant list. So the other thing is the traditional transplant listing guidelines for patients with non-hypertrophic diseases, for example, dilated cardiomyopathies, have made people wait too long to think about transplant in hypertrophic patients. So if you're waiting until some uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients' ejection fraction is less than 35%, then they have needed a transplant for the last 
couple of years and they should have been that should have been discussed way earlier so that is kind of the biggest thing is educating both sides the hypertrophic docs how the logistics of transplant work and the way you can't just send someone to a heart failure transplant specialist and expect them to get a transplant next week that doesn't it's not how it works and i don't think they think that but it just their their competitive disadvantage secondly training the uh heart failure transplant docs to think of hypertrophs very differently once their systolic function starts to drop even a little bit or once they have you know a certain number of arrhythmias we should be thinking transplant way earlier uh than you do for traditional dilated cardiomyopathy patients so the in the future of listing priority also needs to be discussed because currently um I, like i said i personally have the opinion that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients have a disadvantage um uh disadvantage that they shouldn't have because they have less options so because of that they should probably get given higher priority as opposed to patients that we can bail out with heart pumps or inotropic medications. Well, I agree 100%. And uh, I'm happy to say that while UNOS was revisiting the heart allocation system and the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association was very um, loud about their, our disapproval of where they were heading, uh, they did set up a subcommittee to evaluate HCM listing criteria and uh, they've asked Marty Marin and myself to be on that guidelines drafting committee. And there's going to be a document issued nationally shortly explaining when you really should be listing people with HCM and at what priority level. Now, for those of you who aren't in the transplant world, which most of you shouldn't be, the old system of 1A, 1B, and 2 is being put aside for a new system of prioritization of a one through seven listing with HCM being listed as a four coming in the door. And to get above a four, you have to get exceptions. The problem is those exceptions were really not correct of, you know, when they started this process. We're working on refining those exceptions so it's easier for people to get to a three and even easier to get to a two. HCM will probably not ever be ones because it's a very tiny group that's ones. But we should be twos and threes, which should give us a better chance of having a fair opportunity to acquire hearts in an equal pattern to those who have other disease states. And then in June of next year, from what I understand at this time, um, there's going to be another evaluation. So the first evaluation from UNOS was to stop weightless mortality. So you didn't want people dying waiting for hearts. So they did the first phase of the reevaluation to stop weightless deaths. But they didn't look at outcome data at all, which is kind of silly. If you give somebody with HCM a transplant early, we do great because our organs otherwise are in good shape. Our kidneys are good, our liver is good, our lungs are good. We get hearts and we do really well. If you wait too long, you get multi-organ disease. And then we don't do as well. So in June, they're going to revisit looking at outcomes data, which might actually then give HCM patients a bit of an advantage over those with multi-organ disease or more significant disease processes. So we'll stay tuned and we'll see what happens there, but I think we're moving in the right direction. And we're organizing our HCMA writing committee on who and when to evaluate for transplant, which we'll be getting an email on very soon. So, um, that was kind of a fun conversation. I'm going to now tell our viewers, um, if anybody has a question, they can post them while we kind of wrap up with a couple of other things and we'll address some general questions if they have general HCM questions. We can't get into patient specific uh, issues, but we can get into some general HCM questions. Um, so we'll get there. But I do have to ask, other than doing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and heart transplant work all day, and taking pictures of your adorable daughter and putting them on Facebook. And this is when you put the phone up and show us all that adorable picture. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, oh, absolutely she's... precious daughter. Um, look at that baby face. She's just so cute. And this is like the most traveled baby ever. She goes everywhere with her mom. Oh, we yeah. lost her. But oh, she's awesome. adorable. So other than being a dad, what does uh, Kia Afshar do on the off time? Is there any, is there any off time? Yeah, so no, we we actually are pretty good about work-life balance. So my 
big hobbies here. Utah is great for outdoor activities, especially being near Salt Lake. Hiking, mountain biking, skiing are the three big ones um, that pretty much, you know, obviously in addition to hanging out with friends and family and, and um, travel, but the three activities that I think I, I see myself uh, trying to do two or three weekends a month are one of those three things. So in, in the winter here, it's mainly skiing and snowshoeing and um, and then the spring, summer, and fall, it's hiking and mountain biking. Um, those are the big, the big hobbies. And luckily, my wife shares two of those. She likes to ski and hike. Or mountain biking, she likes to, uh, she likes to ride on flat trails. So not so much mountain biking as it is just biking. I probably would be with your wife on that one too, but that's okay. And the next time I come out to Utah, I, I have a good harness. You'll have to take me on a hike, and we'll, we'll figure oh, yeah. it that way. I'm not carrying the baby in the backpack. She'll have to walk. <laughs> we don't. We don't have any questions that have come in yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. I should have grabbed that water I was talking about earlier. Um, but um, Debbie um, Hamilton has um, just a comment here that her hexaline worked for her, and I, I again have to say, yes, her hexaline can work for some, but the study was canceled, and we started something, and then the, the study got pulled back because. Well, because, do you have any insight on why the Brexelin study was stopped? So, I can't speak for sure, but I think, uh, I think it did help. I mean, there was, there was a night and day difference for the patients that we had on it. Um, everyone was on it, so this was not a blinded study. Um, they felt much better in there, but the primary outcome they were looking at was, is, increased exercise oxygen consumption on a metabolic stress test slash what we call a VO2 testing. And in that, they didn't, even though the patients felt much better, I don't think the differences on the VO2 when they did the primary analysis of the data was robust enough where the, the drug company felt they were going to be able to show a significant difference. And so instead of spending more money and trying to recruit more patients and modifying the protocol, they, I think they just decided to, um, the board, the board decided to stop the study and um, maybe reconsider for a different day. So I don't, I, based on everything I heard, I mean, a couple of my patients wanted to fly to Australia to get the drug, you know, because they felt so much better and they were devastated when the study stopped. Um, so I think it does work and hopefully we can restudy at some point in the future, but I think Maybe the outcomes were the wrong ones to look at, or maybe we should look at six minute walk tests or something else. But I think that's that's what I think happened. I'm not on the board of directors of that of anything. <laughs> but, so I don't know for sure, but I, I think that's where it came from. Yeah, it seems to be more of a business decision than a clinical decision in, in yes. my evaluation, but I'm I'm not a whole I'm not on percent hundred percent sure of that either. Um, Trisha, if you're still watching, I did see your comment that you contacted LiveHCM and have not heard back. I would ask that you contact the HCMA office and we'll make sure that they follow back up with you ASAP. Um, they get influxes of lots of patients who are interested in the study and sometimes they get a little bit behind. Um, so you may just want to either call them back or call us and we'll call on your behalf. Um, so... Debbie said it allowed her to go for a couple more months without having surgery being on the perhexylene. So... Yeah, it had some value there. It did. Um, okay, so we have a question from uh, Russell Nicole. Um, any idea why gradient would come back a few months after surgery? Question mark, second myectomy, initially good gradient immediately after myectomy. Um, so I would ask a couple of things before we can really even comment. And that is, you know, where was the surgery done and at what time was that surgery done? Because as we've discussed earlier, your early myectomies, when the volume was lower and the, the thought process was different, didn't have as good of outcomes as they do now um, because you've got additional training and understanding. So it would depend on where it was done, who it was done by, whether it was sectioned properly, and really what procedure they did. We have a tendency in HM to talk about myectomy like it's a thing. It's not a thing. It's an individualized treatment for the patient 
because somebody may have, and I'm going to use like hand gestures here. Somebody's septal bulge may be like this and it's just a knuckle and you got to go in and shave it off and it's flat. Somebody else may have all the way down the cavity and you've got to pull that all out. So there's lots of different things. Were the cordae involved? Was the mitral valve involved? Did they repair the mitral valve? Did they move the, the papillary muscles? There's a lot of subspecialty surgeries. Edmund Chin in August of 2016. Um, so, so I, I can, you, I'll, hit comment, it. I'll comment on this. So I could have said it better myself. So let, let me add a couple more things to that because I was even naive to this before I went to the OR myself and, and watched these cases. So there's, it's if you could open up the heart, fillet it open, and cut out exactly what you wanted, you know, and then close it back up and get an MRI in the OR, that would be awesome. You can probably have the perfect outcomes. But the reality is that the heart is decompressed, it has no blood in it, it's not beating. You're you're cutting out the muscle through your aorta and your across your aortic valve, and the heart is distorted. So that's one thing that makes it a little tricky. The other thing is that it's an art. I mean, it really is. A, it's a skill, but it's an art. Like each person's heart looks a little bit different. And the more and more they do, the, the better and better they get at making the final outcome good. But the most important thing, and I think this is probably, if you ask Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic, probably 30 to 50% of their surgeries are redo myectomies. And the reason why is because the first one usually didn't go deep enough or wide enough. So... Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it the moral myectomy or the mini myectomy is the myectomy that many people trained at, trained in between the years 1967 and 2000, let's say. I'm going to pick the random years. However, the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, and other institutions that do this a lot realize that the best outcomes are probably not taking out just that top portion of the septum, the septal bulge, but more going a little bit deeper into the cavity where the cause of obstruction is probably coming from. So the reason why people get obstruction is that the, the more mid-chamber, deep chamber, is causing blood flow to be uh, redirected and hitting the mitral valve on the wrong side and pushing it into the left ventricular alpha track. Um, it's not necessarily that the, the septal bulge or the septum is getting in the way kind of uh, a different way of thinking. And once they realize that, um, the deeper, more extended myectomy pretty much almost always gets rid of the gradient. The gradient, if you do it correctly, an extended myectomy, a contemporary extended deep myectomy pretty much gets rid of the gradient. Um, I don't know. I'm going to say 95% of the time. Um, a mini myectomy, I would say, probably has a 60% success rate, 70% success rate. So there are a good number of patients who just need, it just needs to go deeper. And those are patients that probably should be going to Mayo um, or Cleveland or, or some high volume center like Tufts or NYU that, that are very experienced in these extended myectomies. We are, we are doing solely extended myectomies here. Um, we never had to go back in to do an, uh, a second one in the last 18 months. And, but at the same time, I just want to be open that certain cases that are more complicated, I will send to Cleveland or Mayo. Um, because, you know, if it requires calm commitment, mitral valve surgery, you really want to go to centers that can do this with their eyes closed. Um, so, Russell, I'm going to go back and comment, and I'm going to be specific, and I'm going to be very careful here in my choice of words. Edmonton is not what we would refer to as a high volume center for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy surgery. And I'm sure that the surgeon that you had is a wonderful person and a wonderful surgeon, but I'm also going to bet that their volume of HCM surgery, myectomy, extended myectomy, is limited in comparison to their peers in high volume centers. And because of the lack of volume, they don't have the opportunity to see these, these really unique anatomies. So I'm guessing that you had an incomplete resection and I would highly recommend that you go to a higher volume program for reevaluation because if you go back to the same center, you're likely to use a similar approach and philosophy. And second surgeries are a little bit more complicated because it's not quite as obvious as to what you have to do. There's something else causing your obstruction. So um, I welcome you to call the office at any time and set up an appointment to talk. 
and we can find out where you might want to go, where your insurance will allow, where it's easy for you to travel to, but we'll help you find the right program to get you feeling as well as you can feel. Um, Judy um, came in late, had an alcohol septal ablation in 2005 uh, in Salt Lake City. Not sure if Utah's developed. No, they were not a center of excellence in 2005. Um, not sure if Utah's developing center of excellence. That's who we're talking to, the Utah Center of Excellence at Intermountain. Um, and it, yes, my acne is now available in, in Salt Lake. Um, being a post-alcohol ablation myectomy also creates challenges. You want to tell her how you yeah, it, yeah, so if someone has a residual, symptomatic residual gradient after alcohol septal ablation, which can, you know, definitely can occur, it is a, a little bit more of a challenging surgery, not one that we feel uncomfortable with, but it, it is a little bit more complicated. There's, there's scar tissue involved. Uh, from the alcohol septal ablation, and the anatomy is a little bit more distorted in the surgeon's eyes. Um, alcohol septal ablation works in certain patients very, very, very well. Um, however, side by side, no same risk factors, same age, same comorbidities. We would prefer a myect in a contemporary extended myectomy in our HCM patients. Uh, we were reserved alcohol septal ablations for patients who are not surgical candidates and or have a very strong preference after being educated that they want an alcohol septal ablation. Um, we, we think myectomy is, you know, a get, gets you a more predictable and long-term uh, uh, obliteration of your gradient. So it's not that we can't do a myectomy after an alcohol septal ablation. So if you do have residual high gradients on optimal medical management with symptoms, it is something you can consider. I would agree. And Judy, um, you can find the contact information to the Intermountain Program on the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy website. Just look in the directory, look under Utah. They're it right now. Um, so I would encourage you to at least get an assessment by the team in your own community that specializes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can just go over to, it's actually not Salt Lake, it's Murray, but whatever. Um, you can go see Dr. Afshar and get evaluated there. Okay, we've got another question coming in. We'll take one or two more questions and then we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, how do you feel about genetic testing in children whose parents are genetically positive? I'm struggling to decide whether or not to test my children. Um, I'll tell you that I genetically screened my daughter when she was seven, I knew she carried the gene. Um, it let me know what was coming and it helped me prepare both uh, strategically to make sure I had care models in place for her and emotionally to get over the fact that genetically we played the lottery and unfortunately we lost the role on that one. And she does have the gene, um, but she's now 22 years old. She's had proper care and she's in good hands. And I didn't have to go through the stress every echo year of, is it gonna show up today or not? I knew and I was able to take her into the proper care model. Kia, what do you think? Should people use genetic? I, I, yeah, we do. Um, we do. I think it's important because, you know, it's a variable expression, variable penetrance type of thing. And, and what does that mean? It means that two people in the same exact family could have the same exact gene mutation and have very different looking hearts, very different arrhythmia burden, very different need for procedures. And we have seen children with, you know, more severe forms than their parents who show up way earlier. And we've seen the opposite. We've seen people who are gene positive, whose parent has horrifically thick walls and needed a myectomy and an ICD, and the children have the mutation and they never end up having anything that looks, you know, like the real deal of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you don't want to miss the child that could have the more severe form. And, and why would they have a more severe form? Probably that there's a second or third gene that's interacting with that pathologic HCM variant. And the combination of those two things cause it to be more severe or manifest earlier. And so I think because sudden cardiac death and stroke are both two potential first manifestations of this disease, it's worth knowing. I mean, it's, it's always emotionally hard. It's always labeling your child as having something that, you know, at an early age. But at the same time, I think the, the risks of something potentially bad that could be prevented is 
is there. And I think in that case, it's good to know. And then, you, you know what, if they test negative, you almost, many people would recommend that they don't need screening ever again, you know? So that's, that's another benefit of genetic testing your children is that you don't have to wonder anymore. If they, if they don't have the gene, then I, according to the guidelines I'm privy to, that there's no recommendations for, for any screening in the future. I'll, that's another benefit. I'll qualify that with, um, you want to keep track of when your genetic testing was done and what changes are happening in genetic testing. I just had a case this morning that the family was screened and the one child was found not to carry the gene, but now is expressing symptoms that are completely consistent with HGM and showing some mild LDH. So I said, when was it done? And you know, what, what happened there? And it turns out that it was early in the, the history of genetic testing and we've now added a number of genes on top of it. And we now understand that there's probably modifier genes in there and things that are playing games that we don't fully understand yet. So if you have a, a clinically relevant pathogenic positive gene and you can screen your child and they don't have it, I would say you have like a 95% chance that probably you're in good shape, but you wanna keep that 5% surveillance out there just to keep an eye on things. Um, Connie, you mentioned that you're screening your children every two years. I just want to recommend that we go by the guidelines. And the guidelines say children between the ages of 12 and their mid-20s should be screened every 12 to 18 months throughout those years and then every three to five years throughout life. Um, so two years might be a little bit long when you're an adolescent because a lot changes really fast in those years. So uh, you might want to talk to your team about, you know, maybe bringing that down to 18 months as opposed to 24 months. Um, you were diagnosed before 30, right? Um, that's, that's very common. Um, most people with HCM, when we're looking for it, you can find it in the teens and 20s. However, when we're not looking in family histories, the average age of diagnosis is 40. So you get there. Key, is there anything you'd like to wrap up with here today? This has been fun. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I think everything that's been, we talked about was great. I, I would love if anyone has feedback for our program, you know, uh, we would love to hear about it because we are, uh, you know, 18 months to two years of doing this and we, we really strive to be honest, the goal, if you want to ask for the goal in five years, the goal in five years is to be one of the top five in quality and, of uh, providing care. I want, I want our patients to be able to get the, pretty much the same care they would if they were at one of the elite centers. And I think we can do it. Um, I think we have the right people and we have the right ambition and we have the right structure to do it. Um, and so I think any feedback we can get from HCMA or any patients or our website, whatever it is, we're happy to do it because I think we have the, the ability to get there. I don't just want to be a center of excellence. I want to be a center of excellence that actually provides the, the excellent care. And I don't even want to be in the top echelon of that. Well, I, I visited your program. I've gotten to know your team. Um, I know many patients who've been there and have nothing but really great feedback at this point. Programs grow, they change. There's going to be growing pain, just part of the game. But uh, I, I expect really big things. And, you know, I expect to see lots of, you know, pictures of your kid on Facebook too, because she's freaking adorable. So um, we thank you for your time today and we thank everybody for viewing us today and stay tuned for more uh, videos like this. I know for those of you who saw the previous uh, interview we did with Dr. Robbie Williams from Emory, the, the system was a little bit different. We're going to have Dr. Uh, Williams come back and do another one of these interviews because this format's so much nicer. And we, we thank Dr. Asher for taking his time today to be with us and answer some of your questions. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to all of them, but uh, we'll follow back up with you offline. So thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Perfect. Thank you so much. It was great seeing you in Boston. Oh, you too. I love the summer. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye. And